Let's begin. Let me pray for us. Lord, I, I ask your, your guidance by your Holy Spirit that you would interpret for us, that you would give us understanding and wisdom as we talk about wisdom this evening, that you would give my mind clarity, that I could share clearly, that we could understand clearly, and that we might come out as uh, sharpened by iron. And we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So I want to start by reading a little passage of scripture. Um, it's out of this book called Proverbs. I don't know if you've heard of it, but um, it begins in chapter 1, verse 1. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline to help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them do what is right, just, and fair. These Proverbs will give insight to the simple knowledge and discernment to the young. Uh, let the wise listen to these Proverbs and become even wiser. <coughs> let those with understanding receive guidance. By exploring the meaning in these Proverbs and parables, the words of the wise and their riddles. Uh, the fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. So if we were to read these, uh, these little passages here, verses 1 through 7, uh, and then we start to follow the entire, entirety of the book of Proverbs, we should live lives that are full of all kinds of good things. We shouldn't have a care in the world. Nothing bad is ever going to happen to us. <coughs> our hairlines should be full, gentlemen. Our waistlines should be trim and fit and no problems. And our children we're all, will all be amazing to us. We will never have an argument with anyone on the road. We'll have no reason to yell at anyone when we're driving our automobiles. Yeah. <laughs> and it goes on and on and on. Is that what Proverbs is attempting to teach us about wisdom? <coughs> so the problem with wisdom books is that their very nature of how they are written and what they are for is unfamiliar to us. Isn't that a theme that we hit time and time again as we're attempting to, here's the big E word, Heather, exegete, which means simply to understand the original meaning, what the original audience would have thought it meant. If we're going to exegete a passage, what did it mean when the original audience was hearing these words as they are written? We, we can't exegete wisdom books very well because wisdom literature is very unfamiliar to us. Did you find this week's chapter confusing? Or was it, it, was, was it revelatory? Did it help clear some things up? I thought, I thought this, with one of the most... I always talk about all, every time we get into a, pass, uh, into a type of scripture, it's tricky. But wisdom literature is particularly tricky because, come on in, come on in, come on in. The problem with it is, is that you can get off track quickly and get astray and, and, and think that it's saying something that it's absolutely not, right? Wisdom literature can trip you up in ways that you just don't see coming because we don't understand what it's saying. And wisdom, by definition, is the ability to make godly choices the ability to make godly choices so my illustration that i've used forever is it's the difference between information and wisdom knowledge and wisdom those are two different things you have to have one first before you can have the other you have to have information you have to have knowledge of things before you can have wisdom. You get that, right? The, the, the way to think about this is, and my wife just clicked her mind off because she's heard it a million times, but you're standing at the bottom of a hill. You look up that hill and you realize that it's icy. And at the very top of that hill is this big old bus and it's cresting the hill. And you've watched multiple cars try to come down that hill and none of them came down in the way that they wanted. 
they all just slid down, right? You're out in the middle of this road. You see this bus that's crested that hill. What can we infer? That bus is going to come down, and gravity is going to take effect. And it's going to come down that hill. And if I'm standing in the road, splat. It's going to get you in mine now. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the one who's writing the story, so it's going to smash us. So we, we know that the curbs are too high. It's going to smash us, right? So that's information. Wisdom says, I'm going to slowly but carefully walk off of this road because it's icy, and I'm going to get behind this house. And that's wisdom. One is information, the other is wisdom. That's why the ability to make godly choices is what wisdom is as a definition, right? And the other problem with the misunderstanding and the abuses of wisdom as we get into that discussion right there is that we treat wisdom literature like it's guarantees. We think that they're universal guarantees, which is kind of where my initial little devotion of reading Proverbs 1, 1 through 5 was taking us. If I follow wisdom, that means everything's going to go right. But Christians would never fall prey to that, would they? They would never fall prey to, if I'm a good Christian, God's going to love me and take care of me and everything's going to go great. That's, what, that's where, uh, in my journey, that I, uh, when I shared my journey the first time we were together, and how that messed with me, when bad things really were dumped into my life and I couldn't make sense of them, in retrospect, I can tell you that's absolutely what I was operating from. If I'm a good little Christian, pat me on the head because I know all the answers to the Sunday school questions, and everybody knows that the answer to every Sunday school question is, that's right, Jesus. And then maybe God and the Holy Spirit, maybe once in a while in prayer, every once in a while is the answer. But Jesus is the answer. That's the problem we have with wisdom. We believe the lie of health and wealth gospel or prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel is a lie from the pit of you know where. Okay? And if you read those pages and how there's a misinterpretation of wisdom literature and how if you follow these, it's a guarantee that everything's going to go great, that's just another way to say prosperity gospel. Right? And uh, so we have all this working against us. How could we, maybe we should just tear those pages out of Scripture and not read them. Maybe, right? Some in the past have done that. You know, some of our, our um, great thinkers, or maybe not so great thinkers, if they didn't like the way a book worked, they just thought maybe we shouldn't have it in the Bible. We should, we should pull it out of there. We should redact it. Remove it. No way. Proverbs, Job, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs really has a lot to teach us, does it not? So we've got to avoid these, these um, natural problems that it comes with. And it's not simple, particularly when it's not so simple, because when it's misapplied, we get off track quickly. And I love it because most every chapter when we read it it's like when you're in in narratives what should you do read it in big chunks all at once what do you do when you're in an epistle of paul read the whole letter what should you do when you're in a wisdom literature piece read the whole thing because the author is trying to make some some uh, points in their writing that you need to follow from beginning to end, right? And you have to understand the flow of Proverbs and what Proverbs is trying to do and the kind of literature it is before you can read one proverb and hope to have it in context, right? Because if, if we read Proverbs 31, ladies, out of context, how abusive is that? Anybody read Proverbs 31 and felt... <coughs> I don't measure up. I, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that the church has used that as a bludgeon for women. Because they've misinterpreted how to read Proverbs 31. And it's in the context of the entire teaching of Proverbs 
and we have to use the rest of Scripture in what it's saying. Because sometimes a proverb or a wisdom piece is saying the exact opposite to make a point. Right? We're going to come into that, too. I mean, that's, if you read, let's say if you read, and the, the book, a chapter makes a point of this. If you happened into Job, and you read one of the air quotes friends of Job, and they're saying something, should we trust their theological position? No. Their words are actually there to teach us the opposite. They're there for us to see, oh, that's how not to think. And if we don't read it in context and understand that it's Eliphaz or whatever, Ele, whatever the names are in there, that it's one of the friends talking and it's not God or it's not Job. And we could absolutely misinterpret how we should think and believe based on what Scripture is saying. And so these abuses of wisdom literature in the culture of church is enough to turn your stomach a little bit. And you know me, my heart is that people of God would know how to open this word and understand it in a way that is coherent and biblical. Biblical meaning, whatever I, wherever I'm at in Scripture, it squares, and I understand it within the context of what Scripture is saying. And there's a big, I mean, there's a big story being told here. And so uh, our, our text went through... Um, some of the abuse of wisdom literature. People often read these books only in bits and pieces and thus fail to see that they have an overall message. People sometimes misunderstand the terms and categories of Hebrew wisdom, as well as its style and literary modes, which leads to misuse. And it gives us the example of, hey, you know, the fool says, and the fool says this, or the fool says that. And, and we, if we don't understand what the word fool means... We could be off on the wrong track. What does fool actually mean? Do you remember? And he, our author even uses what the Muslims often use, terms that an infidel. An infidel is someone who is only self-centered and doesn't want to pay attention to teaching apart from the book. Get that? Got it? Okay, so, so we have to understand the terms. What, what do the terms mean that they're saying? People often fail to understand what the book is all about and thus also fail to follow the line of argument. And I already exampled that. Job's comforters. His friends. How would you like to have friends like that? Right? That's, uh, I mean, that's probably one of the original places that that came from. But think about it. The friends are operating from a prosperity gospel. If you do, if you do right by God, good things are going to happen to you. And if, if you do bad things, bad things are going to happen to you. Well, what do we do when good things happen to bad people? And then when bad things happen to good people, when those things get flipped on their head, what do we do with that? Right, well, <laughs> I, I must be mistaken, Lord. That's right. Assume that part, right? Mm -hmm. And so the abuses are, I think it's a result of our separation from and not understanding what wisdom literature is like. And uh, so then we got into the section of who is wise, did you like that section? The, the uh, wisdom is the ability to make godly choices in life is reiterated. Um, I love the section that talks, I mean, it gets into a pretty lengthy section about the fact that our lives are basically a serial set of choices that we make. You are the sum total of your choices. I really like that. Did you, did you vibe with that? Did you concur with that, that that where you sit right now, you're basically, you're the sum total of your choices. And that how you make your choices can, can have a direct impact on where you're going in life. It makes sense to me. The problem is that our society doesn't want the blame to set with any individual. It's somebody else's fault, always. 
Did you notice that? I mean, if, if your life is a result of your choices, that means you are responsible, right? So, I don't like to hear that. Right, right. Because, because why we don't like to hear that is because there are circumstances that happen to us, right, that are outside of our control. But how we respond to them are our choices. But that's a key thing to figure out. What's a, consequent, what, what's a circumstance, sorry, and what's a choice? What has happened to me that's outside of my control? Well, I was born in a certain time of, of, of life. I was born in a certain place. And I had certain people around me, and they chose to behave around me in a certain way that impacted me, that I didn't have control over. But I have control over how I respond to things. Yes, I'm sorry. Too, too bloviated it's there, not, sorry. It's not completely what you are is what your choice is. There's a lot of things that, good or bad, I mean, that, like you're saying, have nothing to do with it. But some of it is just grace. Mm -hmm. It's like, I should have been. Right. Um, right. This, that, or the other. That's a circumstance. Yeah. Made. Grace is a circumstance. Because of grace Praise God. Or because of mercy. Yes. Those things, I'm not sitting in that chair. Yep. I'm sitting Yep. It's not it's not a simple A B C and I think that's what you know, that's what you're you're kinda of gleaning from it. Yep. It's not yep. I had a pastor tell me once that proverbs are more like probabilities, yes. not promises. Yep. Yeah, they're not promises. We can't use the word promise when we're we're talking about proverbial wisdom. Even in Proverbs or any set of wisdom that's related to us in scripture, it's it's, it's a general statement. I mean, that's, the, the book does a pretty good job of that. It's, it's more likely to, if you do this, 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 it's yep. more likely that this will happen. But it's not a promise that it will yes. happen. Yes, right. right. And it's very interesting because if you read outside of the biblical witness, outside of Bible, outside of the Bible, where you have Proverbs, Job, Ecclesiastes, some Psalms, right? There's, there's wisdom in some of the Psalms, and... The uh, Song of Songs, places like that. When we read ancient literature, there are collections of these kinds of statements. Did you love when you read about that? It's like there, these are these exist in other cultures, except it doesn't center around God. It's just sort of a this is a moralistic way to live, and 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 Yahweh is not the central figure of it which is where the Bible stands apart from other ancient literature and other ancient wisdom books. Okay, so I, I thought that was a really excellent point. And I love the fact that it, because I don't know what my IQ is anymore, but it's not high as I wish it was. <laughs> but uh, wisdom in the Bible has nothing to do with IQ. Did anyone else take comfort in that? <laughs> it's not about how smart you are but with the orientation to God. And, and our orientation to God allows us to please Him. Not based on how smart I am, how much I know, but how much I understand that I am His child, I'm made in His image, that every choice I can make can honor Him, no matter what it is. Like when you drive down the road and you don't curse at people that are cutting you off, <laughs> that can honor God. I don't know if I'll ever honor God that way, but I'm trying. <laughs> It's just the fact. That's right. So, um, and then the fact that you can be non-Christian, ungodly, follow the Bible's witness, and live a more wisdom-filled life, but still be breaking Scripture's mandates. And there's Isaiah 5.21, caution. Um, is an important one that I'm going to read. What sorrow for those who are wise in their own eyes and think themselves so clever. And the implication of that is what? Help me out. Why is that a caution that, that breaks back against what we've been talking about all along? It's missing the point, right? It's missing no, verse 7 of chapter 1 of Proverbs. That the fear of, what is it? The is the? Beginning of it's the beginning of wisdom. 
and we understand that, that fear isn't to, to mean that you're totally terrified of God, though there is some fear in, in that when you think of complete awe of who God is. There's a little bit of fear there. I think a healthy respect, a deep and abiding respect, and, and that goes beyond your capability even. I think the Holy Spirit allows us to sort of fully express that. But we can participate in what the scriptures are leading us to. We can say yes to it. We can surrender to that truth. So, we can see people that are living proverbially wise uh, lives, but not be honoring God with that. That's kind of tricky too, isn't it? People are are living a life that's going to give them a little more of a a chance at an easier path in life because they're following biblical principles. I want it to be different than that. I want the scales to work out in a different way than that. Even though, because of Jesus, the scales are totally not fair. Did you catch that? Even Because of Jesus, the scales are totally not fair. If you were to take all the good stuff I did and all the sin I had, and if all I had is one sin, that scale is out of balance and I'm in trouble, right? You remember way back when I talked, did I talk to you guys about dog poop brownies? Yeah, you did. I thought so. It's, it's the bob, dog poop brownie effect. So you've got the best of all possible ingredients, but you just put one little turd in there in your batch. How many of you want to eat that brownie, even though you know it's the best of everything else? Just takes a little turd, and we don't want any part of it. And... Our souls are sort of like that. There's a little, there's a little bit of uh, dog turd in our souls until Jesus comes. So, if it's gluten free, it's the same thing. Oh, <laughs> right. So, the scales are are there. There's a little bit better way to live life. It's going to set you up for more success. That's pro- that's proverbial wisdom. That's wisdom literature. Uh, but it's not a guarantee. It's tricky, but we got to keep reminding ourselves of that fact. Um, I love the, the, that there are wise men and women that you can read about in Scripture. They were on the same parallel as prophets, right, and priests, and they had disciples, if you will, that would follow their teaching. Um, they would call their, their followers... Um, sons and daughters, and the followers would call the teacher mother or father. And that's some of why we see that language in the book of Proverbs. Because that's Solomon trying to treat us all as his followers and in treating us as such. So I like that about that. I like that there were actually women who were wise women, who were followed, who were called mother, we have some of them in Scripture, Deborah being one of them. She's cited in there. Um, many more than that. Uh, I don't want to step on anyone's toes, but hey, women are important in the kingdom of God. Amen. So, just some saying. And uh, we've, we've spent enough time trying to not do that, not send that message. So, I'll leave it right there. <laughs> um, I... <laughs> I think that, that the, I would talk about the types of wisdom under the section wisdom among colleagues. There's proverbial, there's speculative, and then there's lyrical. And uh, <clears throat> how many of you ever have attended a Bible study or set through a series where the pastor preached through the Song of Songs? Yeah? From the, pul- from the pulpit? preach through the song of songs yeah i've yet to I've, I've i've been a pastor for 30 years i've never known a pastor another pastor whether he or she ever i do it but i don't know how many people would throw tomatoes or whatever but <clears throat> but lyrical lyrical wisdom that song of songs is I think that the more difficulty that I would see in teaching Song of Songs now is that it's completely countercultural. Monogamy? 
celebrating marriage, celebrating the opposite sex, whether you're male or female, that's countercultural now. Mm-hmm. Completely. Completely countercultural. Even within the church, marriage rates are going down in the church. Not just society at large. It's a big deal. Maybe it's time to teach Song of Songs, huh? Um, and then the whole section that Kay Douglas loves, wisdom expressed through poetry. And the, and the impact that poetry is. This is sort of bleeding over into our hyperbole from last week. That the, the scriptures are picking short, pithy, impacting statements to help you remember them so that you can walk around with them. And we had examples of that, right? Look before you... Look before you leap. And then, uh, isn't it... uh, A stitch in time... And that's Ben Franklin, right? I think that's Ben Franklin. A stitch in time saves nine. Those little pithy things that point to bigger truths, and that's, that's poetry. I mean, it's... <clears throat> yeah. There's, there's a lot of those, and I'm not going to say them. Some of them are limericks that I'm never going to say. <laughs> but there's parallelism in there for the poetry. Cinnamon, I can't say it. Thank you, that word. I always say the spice. I don't mean the spice. I mean two things that mean similar things. If I say it slow, synonym. Thank you. Antithetical and synthetic parallelism. Not spices. (laughs) You have acrostics. Remember Psalm 119 is all about the Hebrew alphabet. Every section is another letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's a way for wisdom to be taught so that you can hear it. Alliteration is in there, that sort of thing. But so is hyperbole. So is hyperbole. And um, one of the things that struck me about last week is, um, is some hyperbole that's out of uh, Scripture that's pretty, pretty difficult if we don't allow for hyperbole and understand it within context. There's this little passage of Scripture um, in Luke 14, verse 26, where Jesus says, If you don't hate your father and mother, your children, then you're not fit to follow me. If you don't hate your father and mother, and sometimes it's easy to hate our children, maybe, I don't know. (laughs) Maybe it's easy to hate your father and mother, depending on how they were. But Jesus uses the word hate. I looked it up. The Greek word is there. It's hate. If you don't hate your father and mother and your children, you're not fit for the kingdom. Hyperbole. Was Jesus lying there or was he full of BS? No, he's making a point. Just like Proverbs does. It makes all of these, you, you read it and you just go, oh, wait, wait, what? <laughs> it's hard. Some of the wisdom psalms. But it, it's there for us to remember. It's, it's poetic in a, in a way. It's, it's using a little so, short section of scripture. Jesus is telling us what there? That by comparison, our love for him, everything else should look way down in the distance. It should, be, it should look like hate. And so... That's tough teaching, isn't it? It's telling us a truth. And we can gain that from Proverbs. We can gain that from Ecclesiastes. We can gain that from Job. And it goes through all of those sections of Scripture that in, in individual ways. And that um, wisdom in Job, boy, Job is probably the single most difficult book for me because I think we have to admit that justice and our sense of justice is being suspended. Like what happens to Job isn't right. 
And his friends all try to find ways to tell him that it is right. But it's not. But ultimately, you know, there's that passage in Isaiah, your ways are not my ways, God says. My ways are as far above you as anything you could ever think of. And that to try and understand how a suspension of justice is the way this world is, is beyond my comprehension. But if we don't confess that that's the case of what's going on in Job, because that's what's going on in Job, we're saying that Scripture is a lie. So I have to confess it. Because if there was ever a good man who had bad things happen to him, is it not Job? And, you know, Job is saying, hey, look, I've done nothing wrong, and God is my king. And he's, he's saying that all the way through. And then finally, God speaks and says, yep, you're right. And because I am who I am, this life is worth enduring because it can be done for my glory and I can be glorified by it. And you can, you can rise above it because you, this is not your home. This world is not your home. But that's why I think the wisdom passages are in there for us to be able to handle times when, like that when it hits, isn't it? Don't, I mean, aren't we left wondering, Lord, what is wrong with this world? Why are you doing this to me? Well, God's not doing it necessarily to you, but the world is. And how do I endure it? By realizing that there's a greater truth than the circumstances that I'm in. There's a greater truth. And that Job is that, in that book... In that book of the Bible, it's a book of the Bible for a reason. Life is unfair, and that the world is, is the way it is, and it's not the way it ought to be. And the quicker we can agree to that reality, the better off we'll be. The denial works for a while, but not ultimately. Ecclesiastes, I, I don't, I can't ascribe to the, uh, the first way of interpreting Ecclesiastes that our book talks about, where somehow it's, it's all a foil, it's all saying what not to do with respect to wisdom. I think it's the second way that the book talks about is the interpretation of here's how you live in this world despite all of the fact that it's a vanity and it's a wisp of the wind, it's a smoke in the wind, it's dust in the wind, Kansas and all that. Um, that's, that you can live this life allowing it to be what it is, and enjoy what life can bring to you. I think that's what Ecclesiastes... You remember, you remember this section where it, talk, it talks about there's two main ways to interpret Ecclesiastes? In one way, it's like, oh, it's, it's talking about all the opposite. And then at, at the beginning and the end is what it's really trying to say, which I agree. It's, I mean, all, everybody agrees about that. That chapter 12, at the very end there, was it verse 12 and 13? Or 13 and 14? 13 and 14 is... It's Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 and 14, where it says, the end of all things, here's the answer. Love God and keep his commandments. Isn't that what it says? No matter how you interpret it before that, that is the point. It's the only thing that gives life meaning. Otherwise, it is completely meaningless. And I see within that, it kind of starts there and ends there. It's bookended. I think the chapter talks about that. I was reading another book at the same time and I messed myself up. I shouldn't do that. Anyway, so I think that it starts there and ends there because you need to read this arc of the, the fact that life is the way it is and you can enjoy it only because of the beginning and the end of the book because that gives everything else meaning and you can endure all that other stuff as a result of that truth. Okay. And, uh, and then we get to the wisdom of song of songs. Um, <clears throat> It's not an allegory. It's a love letter. It's, it's love poetry. It's love wisdom. And the beauty of it is, did anyone watch? I just posted it late. I forgot to put the link to the, the Bible Project Song of Songs. Did anyone watch that? I only posted it today, so you probably didn't. But it makes a point at the very end that for a long time, we, we thought Song of Songs was so weird that it had to be something that it wasn't. It was so weird. It's so different than any, any other book. It's got to be, it can't be what it actually seems to be. 
But the problem is that guys and gals who love the dirt, they dig in it, and they find all these artifacts, and we've started to find other Hebrew love poetry and love wisdom, other examples of it that aren't in Scripture, that look very much like it. And there are other cultures that lived around Palestine that had the same sort of thing, and that this was actually a common sort of thing to do, was to write wisdom poetry about love. And I think that's what Song of Songs is. It purports to be that. I don't think it was written by Solomon, although he's named in there. I can't uh, see how Solomon would live a life of monogamy when he had over 600 wives or whatever. Yeah. How did that guy ever sleep? So... But I, I would, I th- the, the beauty that is the message of Song of Songs is wonderful. It raises up marriage. It raises up monogamy. It raises up um, commitment. And the, the book sort of ends really well. Both authors sort of confess that they're long-lived marriages, and they want to raise that up and say that's the way to be. And, and that's not a slam on anybody who's had a divorce in their life. It's just saying the best way to do it is this. Again, is it a guarantee? Nope. It's wisdom. It's wisdom. It's, we're unfamiliar with it. We wanted to make it a guarantee, but it's not. And so there ends the book's chapter on wisdom. So it is 7.10. I beat my time by five minutes. Yeah, so... You guys can head to small group. I'll see you back here at quarter till. Quarter till eight. All right, see you guys back here soon. Okay, it's 7.45. And uh, let's, let's hit any of the questions or sticking points you might have had. So that I can say I don't know. <laughs> Any, anything of uh, particular importance you'd like to raise? Yes, anyone? Bueller. Why do good, bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? Yep. I want to refer you to this little chapter of Scripture. It's in the book of Genesis. Mm-hmm. It's chapter 3. It was going great, and then it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's, that's just a really great question to keep asking because it points to the fact that, um, and I don't mean this in a trite way, that this world is not my home. I'm just passing through because of the difficulty that it really is. And um, yeah, I think that I'm thankful for for places like Habakkuk, frankly, that allow us that outlet to talk about the fact that we don't like the way things are going. Do you, do you think it's good as Christians, no matter how long we've been a Christian, to still grapple with those big questions, or do you think people say, oh well? I, I hope so, because I still do. I mean, I, I became a follower of Christ in 84, so I don't know that's math, but how long is that? Um, so it's, it's not gone away for me totally. Um, uh, the, the funeral we just went through last or two weeks ago, I can't make sense of that other than the fact that something's wrong with the way this world works. And I can't reconcile that. And that it, point, yeah, it points to such a deep, wrongness that it, it's going to take a deep rightness to fix it ultimately and the way scripture answers that makes the most sense to me about that that there's going to have to be this catastrophic moment where everything is just remade um, and I, I think we have to keep asking that question because if we're really feeling that and we don't it gives that question power more power than it ought to have um, and I think, yeah, that's a lot of words to answer your question. I don't think any of it answered it. But 
But, you know, one of the things that, that I would, because I was a youth pastor for so long and students don't know they shouldn't ask hard questions like that, so they ask them, I would just, I would always say you have to keep going to the Lord with that question because it's, it's not answerable from a human standpoint um, fully. And when we keep asking that, keep seeking the Lord on that, it moves it from up here in our brains down to our heart in a way that only he can do that. Um, like, when you guys read the, the lines of, about Job and how Job felt that, that you know, life was unfair and that that was, that was confirmed in Job, that God confirms that, that life's unfair. You read that, at least I should say, I read that and I go, but it should be. I don't think I want that to be true. So that's, that's, I think that's what you're asking me, right? And so if we don't struggle with that, if we don't wrestle it to the ground, if we don't talk about it, then we don't have a truth that's bigger than the circumstances we live. And ultimately, that's why I'm a Christian. I logically, I have a very logical brain. I can ask people in this room, if you told me no, without telling me why, I was not going to follow it. I had to know the why. I had to logically understand. I, I applied that to Christianity, too, and in the long run, it's like, wait a minute, if I'm going to say I'm going to be a Christ follower, this has got to make the most sense. And that's, Christianity offers the problem of evil the best answer of anything I've discovered, you know, in a real honest-to-goodness way. And that, wait a minute, Satan has a domination in this world right now in a way that, that makes sense of the reality that I live and yet God is in control and that's a deeper truth than Satan has domination in this world because it's headed to a place that God says not what Satan says and so wrestling with that brings me back to that truth and I have to rehearse that again I don't know that's not an answer though yes Yeah. When does God cause bad things? Right. Well, that's a totally different question. Yep. Here's what we're talking about. It's the big theological term. It's called theodicy. It's also known as the problem of evil. And causal, the causal relationship, right? Does God cause evil? Um, this is getting into the weeds theologically, but... I believe too much in free will to say that God causes evil. I think that God is so powerful that he created beings that can choose not God. They can say no to God. He created us that powerful. And then he's a gentleman God, so he's like, you can have your way. But I'm going to provide a way out of that for you because I'm a loving God. And so God does not cause evil. Correct. Are you choosing not to believe in God? Correct. And they, they have to say yes. This is why I'm not a Calvinist. <laughs> I'm an Arminian, but yeah, she's like, yeah, I just waded right into it. <laughs> I believe too much in free will. I think that, I think that if, if you have God as the author of evil, I have a problem with that God. Yeah. So. Well, I think you hit right on when you said, you know, God is a gentleman. He respects our free will. Yes. Absolutely. Right. Exactly right. And there's laws of cause and effect yes. that run wild because yep. of choices that human beings have made and uh, maybe unintended, unintended <laughs> consequence, but yep. there are consequences to every action. And he did the part that w was needed in that he told us what the, what the consequences would be of our choices. Yeah. That is so important, right? It's, we're not caught by surprise by it. And that, and that there is an intentionality on our part, a volitional, I mean to do this, don't fool yourself about it. You're not a victim of your urges. You are making a choice. And live with the consequences. So I, that God would make us like that, 
is incredible that we have agency apart from God, our creator. Think about how incredible that is. That goes, I mean, we're trying to do that with AI, but that whole agency that God has given mankind, humans, men and women, is amazing to me. That, but that free will, as wonderful as it is, causes suffering. You know, um, there was suffering immediately after the sin, right? There was, the Lord made skins to cover them. There was death right away. The Lord took, the Lord God took the life of something to create a skin to cover up their nakedness. And immediately there was sacrifice. And uh, if you want to, if you ever wonder if God is consistent from beginning to end, that's where I usually go. That's the grace. That's the grace. Thank God that God is not fair. You know, and, and that's the that's the cool part, you know. You right. Know, there are all kinds of stuff going on and, and right. you know, what am I supposed to learn from my situation or whatever? But yep. you know, every time I screw up, I can repent and I'm right back to this good grace. Yeah. And and the, the God is always gonna play by his the rules that he sets up and and accord, he always acts according to his character and how he who he is. He never runs contrary to it. We do. You know, when Judges says that it, it was a season when every man did as he saw fit in his own eyes, that was one that I was going to make mention of earlier. Um, it's the caution of Isaiah 521. It's the same, it's the same sort of idea that uh, when we become a law unto ourselves, then what is the standard? <coughs> me. Then I'm the standard. How many of you want me to be the standard? In your life. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Careful what you ask for. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I am, yeah, I'm so broken. I can't do that for you. I'm broken. I can't. I'm, I need a savior, dude. I, whew, that's scary, isn't it? And, and yet we look in the mirror and want to do that for ourselves all the time. And um, Proverbs tells us how to uh, help yourself avoid that. Here, here are the guardrails. Go ahead and wreck yourself, but here are guardrails that are going to help keep you on a path. And I didn't talk about guardrails in the first part, but I thought, why didn't I? Because it's the same thing I've been saying all along, that God is giving us these guardrails and saying, look, I want you to have a little accident so you don't have a greater accident. The guardrail is before you get to the cliff. It messes your car up a little bit so that you don't mess up your entire life right? And that's, that's a good way to think about the, the wisdom literature of Scripture. Yeah, right. I, I like the phrase, God doesn't say no, he says don't take the chance. We can do whatever we want. Yeah, and then he says, how's that working out for you? <laughs> Amen. Amen. And uh, I think it's important to just come back to what Jennifer said, that, you know, grace and mercy don't fit in that in that it's bigger than what we've done to ourselves, right? And uh, in a couple of weeks, I will be um, preaching Habakkuk 3, one in, verses 1 and 2, and we're going to talk a little bit more about mercy and the aspect of what mercy is. You know, we, it's one of those aspects of life that we want to receive it, but we never want to give it. We never want to be in a place that we have to give it because it's usually fairly painful, and it costs us something. Um, so, uh, wisdom literature, I just really want us to be reading it. I, I, want, I want you to hear me saying that. I talked a lot about how we can mess it up because it's unfamiliar, but it's absolutely a place that we should be going to. Um, and my youth pastor had me in a Bible reading plan and a Bible memorization plan that had me reading through the book of Proverbs every month. You know, and you had to read double on a couple of months because, you know, there's 31 chapters and you read one each day. And, but uh, I, I recommend that. Spend time reading the book of Proverbs in a month. You know, this month there's only 30 days, but isn't there 31 next month? So it'd be real easy. Just do 
What's the day today? That's the chapter of Proverbs I'm going to read. Just to familiarize yourself with it a little more, yeah. Good question. Uh, do you think uh, wisdom, Sophia, is a personification or like the Holy Spirit? Because in uh, Proverbs chapter 8, you know, it's a narrative that goes all the way through Proverbs except in chapter 8, which is, you know. No. I think it's poetry. I think it's, it's setting up an image for you to, to be able to carry the idea of wisdom with you. It does. Verses of John, you know? Yes, yes. John's writing the same way, though. He's writing it in a way, it's pointing to truth. It's not telling a lie, but again, it's a way to help you. It's putting handles out there that you can grab onto. And because Solomon knows he wants you to understand about wisdom, he's, he's using imagery to help you have a handle on what, what it's like to have wisdom in your life. So I don't think it's... It's, it's a personification. What's that? It's an anthropomorphism. Is that right? Like when, you use, when you use terms to humanize something or whatever, it's an inanimate object. I think that's what it's doing. So, so yeah, I think, it's, I think it's poetry and it's finding a vehicle to help you remember how important it is and how attractive wisdom should be to you um, in your life. It's like a friend that you want. Yes. Yep. Okay. Any other questions before we go? We're almost done. It's 59, so I'm still going to keep my out of here at 8 o'clock. Um, you don't want to miss next week because I'm going to give you all the answers to Revelation. <laughs> yeah, not. No, but I really, I'm, I'm excited to talk about it. I think... Um, I think that you'll find the chapter helpful. Uh, I, I'm going to put a, a pretty thick resource out there. Uh, it's a commentary, but it doesn't read like a commentary on the book of Revelation that really helps you get handles on the book of Revelation. And it's not as weird as you might think. It seems weird to us because we're not ancient Hebrew people, you know? And we're not as familiar with the apocalyptic literature of the Old Testament as maybe we should be. And some of you may be very, you know, you, you realize, hey, I recognize where that, that passage is coming from. But uh, I ex I'm excited for us to read through and talk through that pa uh, passage of Scripture. And then we just have one more week after that. We're going to hit the appendix, and then we'll just kind of do some wrap-up. So in preparation for that, I'm going to take an extra minute. Is that okay? So start thinking about what some of your favorite moments of the, the studying how to read the Bible for all it's worth and jot them down because that's part of what we want to spend our time doing in our last week is sort of hitting some highlights and, and sharing with the rest of us some of the insights that God's given you. And your insight is important. Because some of you just said to yourself, well, I don't want to share what mine won't be, you know, it won't be very interesting or whatever. Yes, it is. So stop that. <laughs> Not on my watch. You're important. I want to hear what you have to say. Okay? So thank you, Lord, for tonight. Pray that you bring us back here again next week, having uh, been challenged by the chapter on Revelation. But thank you for challenging us how, as much as you have uh, these many weeks as we've been together. Thank you so much for Jesus and, and the Savior that he is in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.